Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Broodcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best and innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, any other agency of the U.S. government, any other foreign government entities, or any other organizations with which our guests might be affiliated. So uh, this broadcast, actually, uh, we return here with one of our very first guests from this whole program way back in 2020 when the world was going crazy. Uh, we sort of launched this as a way to to help introduce our, our, our students and faculty and wider community of interest to these brand new shiny non-resident fellows that we had just selected and made all these promises they could come to Quantico and do great things and then nobody could go anywhere <clears throat> at all. So we had to figure out how to find ways for our fellows to continue to contribute. This was one of the, the broadcast is one of the outputs for that. And Chris Ellis here was one of our uh, very first guests here on that lineup talking about military innovation in his own right. Um, so he's, he's back today, but he's also here with Alex Gallo of the Common Mission Project. And they're both gonna talk about the Hacking for Defense innovation methodology. Hacking for Defense is a rapidly growing lean startup based methodology and has grown into the de facto standard for defense innovation education, uh, not just in the United States, but it's got a, it's, uh, it's had a global presence and influence. Uh, so I'll start off introducing Mr. Alex Gallo here. Alex is the executive director of the Common Mission Project, the nonprofit organization that is responsible for coordinating the quote unquote hacking for methodology implemented across 60 universities. And it started at Stanford University in 2016 with a strong focus on defense and national security related innovation. And then, like I said, we welcome back Sergeant Chris Ellis, who is in the New Zealand Army Reserves, flank holding Team Krulak non-resident fellow. His pack, uh, excuse me, his past work with the New Zealand Army includes development and delivery of innovation training packages for the Army Almond Gia program and New Zealand Army General Staff. Uh, he's also, uh, his course has been added to the New Zealand Defense College curriculum, and he's delivered similar classes to the Royal Australian Air Force's Air Warfare Center, Combined Arms Training Center, Special Operations Command, and Australian Defense Force Academy, excuse me, Australian Defense Force Academy. Um, he's also an alumnus of the Stanford University Graduate School of Business, certified as a Hacking for Defense educator. And uh, this is where these two threads sort of um, coalesce here. So we have sort of the, uh, you know, the originator, one of the initial founders of the program. And then we have Chris here as one of the outputs and, and practical applicants of the Hacking for Defense program. So gentlemen, welcome to both of you, uh, especially, uh, you know, Chris is always, you know, uh, you're very patient with us and trying to find a time when we're not like keeping you up in the middle of the night or some ungodly hour to get on the program. So well, appreciate your flexibility. Welcome both of you. And uh, we're going to start off here with uh, Mr. Alex Gallo kind of giving us a background overview of, you know, what is the hacking for defense methodology? Where did it come from? Why was it seen as something that was necessary in the field and, and more? So Alex, welcome to the program and you can take it away. Thank you, Ian and Chris. It's nice to be here with you guys today. Um, the origins of hacking for defense really started on the battlefield. Um, and, uh, you know, something that I think I know this audience would relate to is that, you know, when I served in combat in Iraq uh, with the Army and, and Chris and others have been in the field, we know that um, just keeping up with the enemy is not good enough. And really, military soldiers on the battlefield have to act as entrepreneurs. They have to find ways to get ahead of the enemy. And so there was this fortuitous meeting back in actually, you know, 2015 time period with uh, Pete Newell, who is the CEO of BMT and one of the founders of the Common Mission Project, this nonprofit. Um, Steve Blank, who's the creator of the Lean Launchpad or Lean Startup Methodologies, kind of interchangeable names. And um, another gentleman named Joe Felter, um, who is now the director of the Gordian Knot Center at Stanford University. Pete and Joe were retired Army colonels and had experience serving in combat. Steve was a successful serial entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and they recognized this need to bring more entrepreneurial thinking to battlefield level problems. And so they said, like good entrepreneurs do, let's do an experiment. 
let's see moreover if we can bring in non-traditional problem solvers. So in this case, university students to help work on those problems. So in, 25, in 2015, they did an experiment during spring break at Stanford. They brought together a bunch of Stanford students from various disciplines. They got real world problems with real world government sponsors and had those student teams work in an interdisciplinary way on those problems, leveraging Steve Blank's uh, lean startup methodology. And in short, through the course, they came up with some really interesting solutions, but more importantly, at the final briefings of, after this really quick sprint over a spring break time period, when the students stood up in the back of the class and said, if this was a course at Stanford, I would take, I would have taken this. And so this led to cr the creation of a course known as Hacking for Defense at Stanford. And the nature of the course is we source problems everywhere from the warfighter level all the way up to the policy level and the Department of Defense Enterprise and everything in between, curate them and inject them into these courses around the United States, but as noted also in the UK, Australia, and increasingly in New Zealand, which Chris will talk about as well. And the students form into interdisciplinary teams, work on the problems and hand those solutions back to their government sponsor. And really there are two outputs out of the course. One is we're introducing kids, students, generally at the grad level to national service. These are people who have never maybe contemplated this before, don't know a lot about the military and IC. And we do see not just attitudinal changes about working with the government, but we see transformational um, steps in their own lives. We've had students because of hacking for defense go into army OCS, for example. And then the other thing that's really interesting that's come out of the course are companies. And our most successful example of that is a company called Capella Space. A Capella Space today is a company that does synthetic aperture radar satellites. They work with various entities in the US government. They were working back at Stanford in 2016. They were a student team who worked on an Air Force ISR problem. And not only do they recognize they solved the problem, but the Air Force itself recognized there was not an entity in the defense space to actually service the solution. So a company was formed. And there have been 53 examples of companies formed out of Hacking for Defense. So Hacking for Defense is also building out that national security innovation base, which has been missioned in the in 2018 national defense strategy and, and further on national defense strategies. So that's the origins of Hacking for Defense, Ian. All right, great, thank you, Alex. And so, um, Chris, we'll turn it over to you now as one of the, you know, sort of the, the outputs of that process. Um, you know, you I think you, you touched on it a little bit the last time we had you on in the program, but, you know, so how did you get, get in, you know, from, from down there in New Zealand, how did you get involved with the Hacking for Defense program? Um, what, uh, what, what were the courses or focus areas you took? And then how did you come back and apply it to your own job as a military professional? Yeah, I guess for me, it's probably worth prefacing that um, uh, I've done everything sort of back to front. Uh, a lot of people will join the, the military early, um, have their career, and then they'll go in the commercial sector afterwards. I kind of did it backwards. I started out in the commercial sector working in Semicon and at Amazon before I immigrated to New Zealand and joined as a reservist in the, uh, the post-2001 environment. Um, so I, I've, I've had that unique opportunity of sort of seeing um, uh, both sides, how the commercial sector works, how government and military works. And uh, uh, what had happened is I, I'd somehow managed to sneak into uh, getting accepted to Stanford. And um, when I did and I was prepping for the move, I was having a good look around at seeing what what uh, opportunities there were to explore at Stanford uh, with with a key focus on innovation. And I saw uh, what, what Alex prefaced with the uh, Hack for Defense uh, pilot course was being run. Um, so I, I managed to actually get um, in touch with Joe Felter and uh, uh, Joe brought Pete Newell uh, to breakfast. We had uh, we had breakfast one morning when I was at school and uh, it really opened up my eyes to what the opportunities were. And I guess the way I see it is when I look at hacking for defense as a methodology, you know, a, a common framework, common methodology, common language, it really reminds me of um, the military decision making process, the orders process. Um, so I've had the chance to uh, conduct orders and, and listen to orders, take orders um, from folks across five eyes. Um, so we've got Australia, New Zealand, U.S., Canada, uh, U.K. I've had exposure to all of them. And what's really interesting is while there's some slight variations amongst them, um, it's, it's close enough to where we all understand each other. 
you know, we can operate, uh, we've got that interoperability to a certain extent. And what I saw with um, the Hacking for Defense program is the same potential, the same capability of being able to do the same thing. Um, so when I think of uh, operations, um, the way I view it is if, if you are my commander and you've ordered me to uh, conduct a reconnaissance patrol, and I go out on that reconnaissance patrol and we get bumped by the enemy and we come back, the first question you're going to have for me is, all, are all of our people okay? And then after that, you're going to say, well done. You know, we found out where the enemy is. We found out where to go to hit them or where not to go. Um, we've learned. Um, the problem is, is when we take that same sort of uh, operational example back into the camp environment, you know, we become so risk averse. Um, whereas we, we take calculated risks on operations, we seem reluctant to do so back in a camp environment. And I think what this allows us to do is the opportunity to make, you know, to, to learn, to discover, to scout and, uh, and, and make some mistakes. Uh, and, and I think that's where uh, I was really, I, I bought in early to this in 2016. And, and I think the results that we've seen since and how it has expanded, you know, it has really scaled. You know, it is a repeatable process. It's scaled across uh, pretty much the majority of the five eyes now and into NATO. And uh, I think it's a real opportunity we have to see this expand in that sort of the, the non-kinetic space of uh, supporting uh, the future warfighters. It's, it's that sort of um, that scouting process, really. Great. Thank you, Chris. So um, to, to both of you, next question is, uh, you know, maybe if you could ex expand on from your various perspectives, some of the places where you've seen this methodology been implemented successfully. And I understand that, like, it, it's probably operating in places that are not necessarily quite as visible um, or, or receive as much attention as some of, you know, like the the higher, like big, you know, capital I innovation projects under the defense department. Um, but for, for example, like one place I never would have thought about it, but uh, I don't know, it was several years back and I might've been at the um, back at the squadron level, but I remember there was a hacking for defense um, program applied to some aviation maintenance challenges, mm -hmm. which were becoming kind of, you know, pretty acute in some parts of the Marine Corps due to the, you know, ages of the airframes and parts availability and stuff. But like, I never would have necessarily expected, you know, a, Stanford Innovation Unit to come in and help provide some feedback to that, but like that can be very impactful. <laughs> and basically, like you you get aviation made and wrong, you're going to be pretty limited in what you can do. In a lot of other places, you get it right, it's a great enabler. So, so for both of you, what are some places where you've seen it have a, a really good impact? You're absolutely right. We've seen a, a ton of maintenance problems come into hacking for defense from all the military services. On average, we source about 200 problems a semester from the DoD in the U.S. And um, we're running about 20 to 30 universities a semester, and they run the gamut, but as I said, at, at including maintenance problems. I have two examples that come to mind. One is a uh, Navy SEAL one that we always talk about, which I will uh, will just tell you about because it also illuminates the power of the method. And the second one is one with the Ohio National Guard. Um, so first, the Navy SEAL one. Um, this would also happen to be a Stanford University team, but um, they're working, the chief medical officer of the SEALs was co concerned about SEALs getting hypothermic on mission. His hypothesis at that time was that SEALs, there needed to be some kind of Fitbit type device or some way to monitor SEALs while they're on mission. Um, because it, you know, if they get hypothermic, it puts risk to mission, of course, and risk to personnel. Um, and so he wanted to create some kind of technological like Fitbit device. So students took this problem and they went, started iteratively hypothesis testing, which is the core base method of lean startup. And they first they interviewed Navy SEALs, so people who would be the end user, someone who would actually wear such a device. And they said two interesting things from that conversation. Um, I won't say it exactly how they said it, but you can imagine. Um, one thing they said is, you mean to tell me somebody in the rear back of the talk is going to monitor me when I'm on mission? Um, that blank is going to end up at the bottom of the ocean, referring to the Fitbit device. So the Department of Defense could have paid for or bought for millions with millions of US taxpayer dollars is said device littering the bo bottom of the ocean. But more, I would say maybe more importantly, or at least equally importantly, they also, they also, the student teams recognize as they started mapping the workflow of a doctrinal raid for a SEAL, where they go to the objective and return, um, they recognized that the chief medical officer had the nature of the problem wrong. 
seals when they're navigating with uh, their delivery vehicles and such, they can't surface and they're essentially doing train association underwater and while trying to maintain operational security. And so in short, they don't go the most efficient tr path to the objective and back. And that's what was increasing their hypothermia. So the students quickly pivoted the problem statement, and this is the power of the method, away from the idea of hypothermia per se, and more towards the true nature of the problem, which was navigation. And in short, they created this buoy-like device that would allow seals to essentially create a waypoint system underwater where the, without surfacing, where they could swim, 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 put up the buoy, take in GPS data, to un, bring it down, understand where they're on the earth without surfacing, and then go to the next waypoint and the next waypoint and so on, thereby diminishing, making their navigation more efficient first, and then second is diminishing their risk for hypothermia. And that's just an example of how a problem statement from a total outside group leveraging that method who knew nothing about Navy SEALs could, could actually come to potentially a better outcome. The second one I want to mention is this Ohio State University one in the Ohio National Guard. This is another good example where the government comes in with a technological issue, but actually maybe it's a policy issue. Um, a student team in Ohio State, they were working on a problem where Ohio State National Guard were trying to find ways to talk to civil authorities in Ohio with drones, finding a way to coordinate and conceptually talk to each other. They initially had a, the National Guard had a hypothesis that what we needed was some kind of app or way to connect these two drones. The student team Ohio State took on this problem. And over time, again, they recognized that the technology wasn't specifically the nature of the problem. They recognized there was actually, they could talk to each other. There was in fact a legal barrier for them to talk to each other. And so the student teams again pivoted away from this technological idea and more towards a policy solution. And they actually created national defense authorization legislative language that would change the law. And the National Guard Bureau submitted that as part one of their alleged proposals to that year's, that fiscal year's NDAA. So here again, the students were able to like discern using the method, the specific nature of the problem and pivot it in a way that's constructive for the government. Yeah, that, now that's actually a really fascinating example because I, you know, thinking of some, you know, contingency or crisis response is not necessarily a military operation. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's probably going to be some coordination with civil authorities and ensuring you have the right permissions, even if you have the right technology. Um, something that is always going to be a challenge there in that situation. But um, that's, a, that's a great sort of proof in the pudding for why it's important to do that. It's not the technology. Um, Chris, did you have any any examples you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, I've got two. Um, just to preface is the, the courses we've run have been very abbreviated versions. Uh, they've been running for approximately 72 hours, so three days as opposed to, say, a full semester long. So it's been a pretty high tempo over a short period of time. But uh, one, we were able to get uh, a working prototype of uh, discrete antennas um, for uh, non-traditional vehicles uh, being used overseas of just trying to reduce the, the profile of, of folks operating overseas. And uh, with uh, local units, 3D printing, we were able to uh, develop and install uh, actual working prototypes of some discrete antennas to reduce their, their profile for, uh, uh, for further development. The other one was quite interesting was um, there was a unit that was looking at um, getting access to commercial facilities for training. And uh, while they had their, their own training facilities, uh, you run the risk of templating over time and they want to use um, uh, some new facilities to, to add that uh, unknown factor. And they were really struggling with getting permission um, to use some of the buildings. So um, what the team was able to discover is that um, the, uh, the nation state actually underwrote the uh, terrorism insurance. Um, uh, and as the ultimate underwriter, uh, they've got some influence in there. So they went the route of uh, uh, non-traditional means of trying to get uh, uh, an agreement with property owners um, via the uh, insurance scheme of uh, exploring whether they could possibly get rebates, for example, uh, or perhaps a different um, uh, risk premium if they have access to those buildings prior for training. Um, and that's what they were able to deliver in just 72 hours of, of looking at a different way of gaining access to training facilities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, but yeah, uh, 
we've got everything that runs the gamut from uh, trying to solve a parking problem uh, on these short courses, uh, all the way up through the example Alex gave of um, Capella Space, that in a mere seven years, they've got seven satellites in space. They've raised approximately a quarter billion dollars in funding, and, and they've got a much bigger satellite array on the way. So it, it runs that whole gamut. And I think it's probably worth mentioning that, um, you know, you, you look at uh, an organization on, on, on the civilian side, like Y Combinator, for example, the name may not be that well known outside the tech sector, but names like Airbnb, Reddit, Dropbox, Coinbase, they're all very well known. And they've all come out of this incubator of about 4,000. And, and I think what you have with the likes of Hack for Defense, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have volume. You're going to have hundreds and hundreds of ideas coming through it, you know, and, and problems to solve. And you're going to have a couple of real big ones like Capella Space, those moonshots. And you're going to have a whole lot that are, are going to help, um, you know, a small team of soldiers, sailors, uh, aviators, and Marines. It's going to make their lives better. And you're going to have a lot of learnings along the way of what not to do. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. Great. Thanks, Chris. And I, I think it's interesting. You both sort of mentioned, you know, examples of this that, again, we're not not hacking to make like a new thing or do something specifically with, with technology. But just look at, you know, a, a procedural or a a, you know, a legal framework in a different fashion. Um, and I, I think that's important to highlight because, you know, one of the things that we sort of advertise out of the crew lack center we're, we're very upfront like we don't make widgets here we're, we're an innovation center but we're not an innovation center that's like making stuff um to put in your hands although we can right we have some 3d printers we can but uh, our larger point is that conceptual um innovation in looking and thinking about um things differently and those things can be conceptual and tangible like a policy or procedure so Absolutely. no it's good it's great to hear that from both of you well, um, on that note on that note Ian, yeah. i think that's really worth reinforcing i think you you've made a, a, a huge point because we just ran into this issue yesterday so we're running a big program uh down here in the next couple of months and and there is uh some immediate confusion when it comes to that term hacking um so it's not you are absolutely right it's not just about the cyber domain it's just about solving problems and um uh, it's probably worth throwing in a quote from uh pete newell you know one of the one of the people that made hacking for defense and common mission project possible is um, he had that quote, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, is that, you know, innovation is not about technology. It's about sociology. It's about people. That's it. Yep. That's his quote. Yeah. And hacking for defense, as you said, really does a great job of understanding and all that human terrain, so to speak, uh, within a bureaucracy that where, where innovation can really occur. Yeah, I, that, that's a good thing to capture. And I was I was just scanning my head around looking at the quotes we have on the walls here because mm -hmm. I'm confident we have something in those lines from somebody famous, but I can't quite see it right now. So I'll uh, I'll turn my attention back to here. OK, great. So I'd like to start going through some of the questions in the chat here from our audience. And uh, first one from Bazir Riot and um, Alex is probably more more applicable on your side. Um, you know, but Chris, feel free to, to share your perspective. But this first question goes into, I, I guess there have been a couple post 9-11 changes of public perception between the military population and the general population, you know, going from thank you for your service to, um, you know, there were some civilian educational institutions that like would no longer let, um, you know, ROTC or some of the recruiting things on their campus because of disagreements with, you know, some of the, re you know, recruiting and, and manpower policies at the time. Um, and, and that's, that's obviously the post 9-11 world is actually, I think about it, it's been a very long time. Like that's a couple of decades. So those perspectives have changed and gone back and then changed again. But, um, sort of today, uh, you, you sort of touched on it Alex, a little bit in terms of like the sheer volume of projects, defense projects done, but, um, I, I'm assuming hacking for defense is now, you know, seen pretty positively, at least on Stanford, but, you know, both in Stanford and the other places where these programs are in place. Has it assumed, you know, not just a problem solving aspect, but it is, is it also sort of a a, a public um, diplomacy or like a, sort of a way to improve or tighten up sort of civil military relations based on the, the teams you're bringing together to solve these problems? Yeah. And Basir's question is, is spot on. Um, as noted, we at the top, Ian, I think you noted, we, we run the program at 60 universities across the United States. So that alone shows that there's uh, acceptance and and willingness and interest to engage in it. But to your point, um, uh, one way, one other way to think about hacking for defense is it's the ROTC of the 21st century. 
it's a way for folks to serve and provide service to national service to the nation without joining the military, uh, without serving in government, but they can still work on critical public problems for our national security. And I should also mention we do it. We have programs that go beyond hacking for defense. Now we have hacking for homeland security with DHS hacking for diplomacy with the state department. And we also have hacking for climate oceans and, and, and the environment on the non-defense side. So this is a, this kind of approach this problem solving approach is expanded to a lot of different domains. And as I mentioned in my lead up, absolutely. There, there are, there is skepticism on campuses about the department of defense, the military, the intelligence community. Um, but what's interesting is two things. One is what brings students into the course is not, um, you know, it's, it, it's not per se that it's a DOD oriented problems. It's just the problem. So really, in, really smart engineering students, business school students, public policy students, when they see a problem, that's what they want to work on. And the fact that it's the DOD problem, let's say, is just second or third order. So they're really captured by the problem. And, and another quote from Pete Newell, he's full of them. He's like the, the, the Jim Mattis of this, but uh, got lots of great quick quotes. But another one is problems are the currency. And they are the currency for innovation and problem solving. And then students, because the students can eventually see themselves in the problem. And as they work on it, and I mentioned this earlier, across the semester, they're interviewing upwards of 100 military, uniform military and civilian. And what do they find through that process? Not only do they learn more about the nature of the problem, but second is they learn that the DUD, IC, law enforcement are moral, they are ethical, they do follow the law. And actually they're pretty cool, I could have a beer with this guy or gal. Um, these are the people I want to work with. And it does. And we see the, those attitudinal changes where someone, a student may come in as more skeptical. And then over time, they become more interested in working with the government. And that is powerful for us in the context of great power competition or strategic competition or whatever DC term you want to use. Um, because China has its version of civ mill fusion, an authoritarian version. And hacking for defense at least models, I think, a more democratic version of bringing together the, the civilian population and our government and military to preserve our security. I would I would amplify that with two things real quick. One is um, I know when I grew up, uh, everybody on our street had a veteran in the family. You know, you fast forward to today, um, there's probably a greater divide between the the, the serving veteran community and the non-veteran community. We need to fix that, and I think one way to fix that. Is, is through something like hacking for defense because we need to. And, and the reason why we need to is, um, uh, I remember a number of years ago, Steve put together, Steve Blank put together a slide that showed uh, what the percentage of uh, research and development was that was sort of government military versus commercial off the shelf. And it's really changed, you know? So in short, 1945, end of World War II, almost all R&D was, you know, government uh, dot mill, um, uh, so to speak. You go to 1989, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall was about 50-50.mil.com. You fast forward to today, it's the other way around. It's about 90% effectively .com, 10% .mil. So most technology is commercial off the shelf. Uh, we need to engage with students, with academia, with the commercial sector um, better, faster than we ever have before to, to basically uh, be able to win the future. Great. Thank you, Chris. And Alex and Chris, you both just you made a couple of points that feed very well into the next couple of questions I got in the chat here. Um, so I'm, I'll uh, we'll start off with uh, Al Alex the point you made about the you know strategic competition, great power competition, and other actors out there who were you know taking their own approach toward innovation, civil military fusion. But so yeah. uh, Bazir had another question about no knowing that and sort of knowing both I I'd say China perhaps as a primary actor, but but others, you know. Other entities, um, countries or groups, not necessarily friendly, you know, with the United States or with sort of the five eyes or, the, or you know, whichever Western alliance you want to pick. Um, how have have you had to put any sort of safeguards in place or any sort of um, in, any framework where you're you're ensuring that the work you're doing in support of whether it's, you know, hacking for defense for the U.S. or for a an ally and partner or for Homeland Security, what have you. That that information is not, you know, making its way to mm -hmm. adversarial actors, um, and and we we do know, for example, um, you know, countries like China, they're they're funding sending a lot of students over to American universities because they are doing good research, um, you know, but to also pull that information for their own uses. Yep, it's an excellent question, another good one, and um, 
so uh, Basir, I mean, the short answer is yes, we are completely cognizant of that risk. And let me just kind of illuminate that in three ways. Um, first is all in the United States, but this is also true in the United Kingdom and Australia and what um, um, Chris is doing in New Zealand. Um, all these problems are all unclassified, unclassified and open source in nature. Um, so what does that mean? So we've had problems from the DIA, NSA, obviously all the military services. And if they're if they are classified in nature, we do have a process to make them into proxy problems, right? So that students can still work on them, but they don't trip any wires. Second is there's um, obviously within the DoD, and, I'm, and these are tr this is true about our um, Five Eyes and other partners, but um, just speaking the U.S., um, everybody. It recognizes the OPSEC risk. And so any government person participating in the program is knowledgeable about who's who's on the student team, uh, are they foreign nationals, and obviously are maintaining OPSEC all the way through that interview process. And that's just standard procedure that everybody in the department knows how to do and receives training on. And then third is, I should mention also, in spite of these risks, the benefit uh, that Congress has seen in this program has outweighed those risks. So Congress has authorized this program in Section 225 of the FY18 National Defense Authorization Act. And, you know, they've continued to consistently support it, not just in authorization, but in appropriations each year. And um, because they see great benefit in having non-traditional problem solvers use a method that the Department of Defense usually doesn't apply to their problems um, to create, you know, more, you uh, you know, um, new solutions that haven't that they haven't thought of. So um, there is there is that risk. And, and again, we're very conscious of it, but um, there are different ways that these have been mitigated. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Alex. And Chris, same to you. And I would imagine you may have some different, you know, additional perspectives because geographically the challenge is quite you know, a lot closer to you than it is to, to Stanford or us here in the CONUS. One real quick story on that is uh, we were working a problem on how to uh, reduce the weight carried by soldiers um, with uh, the products coming into service in the near future. And one of the things we were looking at was cargo drones. And, you know, we came up with the form factor, uh, which is basically something about the size of a coffin. Uh, anything that you'd be able to fit in a line rifle company, you know, and how far we would want to move that, say, 100 meters, you know, get it to forward edge of the battle area and back. You know, so we, we build it around the form factor of this effectively a, um, a coffin shaped um, pallet and with a drone on top. And that's as far as we got. It was just more of a thought experiment. Well, um, that's been developed by the Turks. So the next question um, jumps off of um, Chris, it's something you said in terms of the consolidation of technologies and uh, sort of the R&D and where it's gone. Um, and so in addition to. The, the shift in the percentage, it's also been, at least on the defense side, the number of, you know, defense um, industries that are doing the work has been at, like smaller and smaller. And I, I've seen this like wire diagram of how like back in the 40s, 50s, you had like dozens of companies and they have all sort of slowly shrunk down to to five or six big ones. Um, so in, in, along with the consolidation, there's been increased complexity in defense acquisitions projects and then also much slower procurement processes for actually getting things to the field. So um, so with that, for, for both of you, you know, you've talked about these moonshots or these startup efforts and, um, and you know, again, large number of projects done for defense innovation. What, what have you seen in terms of the sustainment of those projects once you've done them? You know, you hand, you, you get the problem, you hand the solution back to, uh, you know, defense department or whatever security department you're doing it. Um, have they been sustainable over time? Um, I think probably the the best option there is looking at what um, Pete Newell and C Blank have come up with in terms of the innovation pipeline is is how you uh, not just curate the problem, but you experiment on it with a solution and how you carry that through to implementation. And I think uh, Alex would be probably in a far better position than I to talk about that back end of that innovation pipeline, which is uh, innovation and procurement and all that it's uh, it's a big problem to solve in and of itself and, and i think they've made some good progress there yeah yeah 100 percent they have but what's interesting on this um on your question maybe come three items come to mind here as well um first is there are three types of outcomes in hacking for defense 
and for the government sponsor. The first is sometimes it's a policy solution, policy guidance or what have you, like I mentioned in the Ohio State example. That's something the government has, is able to implement you know, fairly efficiently, and they have implemented those kind of things. So um, that's one course. But as we know, any technological solution usually has some policy solution that has to go with it. So that's there's that. The second is on the tech side of things, um, I mentioned there are, there have been 53 startups. Many of these startups have been successful. The best example is Capella Space, but there's Lumini that's received money from the United States Army. That was a Boise State University team and so on. There's a number of teams that have been successful. I think though, however, where we need to get better with the Hacking for Defense program is having a more systematic process supported by the government to support these startups coming out of Hacking for Defense. Um, we've done some piloting activities, but um, I think I think the government should invest in what we call the right side of the pipeline and thinking about how do we keep these technologies to live on. Because in hacking for def there are multiple values of death. Uh, we all know the the main value of death we were referring to in the question around the acquisition process, but there's another uh, value of death is your student team that's just formed a company and you do have an amazing solution for the Air Force, let's say for example but your student team that just formed a company, we need to be able to have programs that support these student teams as they're formed LLCs to live on further and to get to experience the second, the second value of death, I guess you could say. And what's interesting though in the course is uh, my, my third point here on what the outcomes are is that in the course, the students not only uh, investigate and validate the problem, they come up with solution pathways, solutions, but also solution pathways they have to do discovery around the contracting process and how could this be ultimately adopted. And every problem not only has a problem sponsor that I've mentioned, but every problem has a senior leader with authority and resources to implement any solution in Hacking for Defense. So that, that has helped with allowing this uh, stuff to live on. Okay, so next question from our audience here from Captain uh, Rico Salve, uh, retired of the United States Navy. And this is an interesting question because it, it, it it touches on one way we approach innovation through the elective program we offer at the center. So the question is, what value do you think in in the physical learning environment itself? Uh, what does the environment ha impact have in terms of making breakthroughs or having innovative insights? And I, I'm, I'm foot stomping our pro our elective here because our where good ideas come from elective program that we do at Command and Staff College. Part of how it's run is we change the location of the class every single time. And so we'll have the students pick a new place, you know, somewhere either on base or or more preferably off base away from campus in a totally different environment just to see what that does for our discussions. Um, but for either of you gentlemen, have you uh, have you implemented that or, or found that it has a, an impact on the, you know, the insights that come out of the programs? Yeah, well, what I think is probably most um, intriguing about the Hacking for Defense class is uh, the concept of the flipped classroom. So I don't think the room per se is that important it's like uh the, the old agoge it's just a sand pit um i think it's what happens within it um so for the hacking for defense uh classes is uh it's a flipped classroom you've got your teaching team sits in the back and every team must present every class so it's a bit sort of like uh, if you think of a uh, uh, law school socratic method you know you're putting people under the pump you're putting the team under the pump each week uh, or each class you know, the expectation is that you're actually getting out of the classroom, which is another famous expression uh, from Steve Blank of Hacking for Defense is that, you know, the only reason why you're in the classroom is to give the updates. Other than that, get the heck out of the classroom and go meet your beneficiaries and users, you know, and if you haven't met with 10 or 15 beneficiaries or users since your last class, you, you need to leave now and go go meet with them. Um, and, and that's what I think is really, really compelling about it. Um, anything to add, Alex? Yeah, no, I, if I could just, I totally agree. If I could just double tap that latter point. Um, uh, Steve Blank's line, since we're, we're doing a lot of quotes today, as I should attribute the RTC of the 21st century, that's Steve Blank's quote as well. But, um, you know, yes, yeah, Steve's, you know, main point, and this is the core understanding of Lean Startup, because it's discovery base, is there's no answers in the classroom, period. There are no answers. Um, you have to get out of the classroom. It doesn't matter where the classroom physically is, is that you're getting out of the classroom and actually talking to folks who experience the pain point and the problem. So that's the most important feature of it is that most university courses, I teach hacking for defense at Georgetown this spring. I'm doing it right now. 
uh, in their master's in security studies program. I also teach a course in the fall at Georgetown. That's a more traditional course. Our courses, those two courses could not be more different. Um, the one I teach in the fall is much more in the classroom, so to speak, and lecture based. And the course I teach in the, the spring is students are not even in the classroom. They're out of the classroom talking to people, actually learning the pain points and the unique value propositions of solving the problem for those end users. That's the most important thing for innovation. I just, you know, Pete yesterday, Pete Newell, who we keep referring to, um, you know, when we were talking about uh, what are 21st century skill sets that people need, it's the ability to go and talk to humans and be able to do a systematic discovery process. Great. Thank you very much both. And I, I Alex, didn't know that you taught at Georgetown as well. Um, Maybe we'll see you up there sometime for one of the Georgetown University Wargaming days. Okay. Because uh, we have we have we've had a long partnership. Another of Chris's fellow non-resident fellows, who uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Sebastian Bay, he teaches up at Georgetown, but he also teaches war game design, I believe, for that same security studies program. Cool. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll see you up there. We catch each other, we'll roll dice or something one day. Look forward to it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um. So, actually, another next question from Albert Lee and. Um, you talked a little bit about actually that I think that contrast of those two programs, Alex, you just mentioned is a good baseline for this question. But what are the different sort of the, the, the backgrounds and demographics of the students who, who participate in these things? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, are, are they largely a a security or sort of a STEM background or do you have students from like multi, multi multiple different disciplines who participate? Um, it's the multiple different disciplines is the answer. Um, but let me just allume, you know, unpack that a little bit. Um, as I said, each student team has like about four to five people on each team that have their own problem and their own government sponsor. So there could be, you know, as many four to five teams in each university course that's going on across the United States. And again, like I said, they have their own problem, own problem sponsor. And the areas that they usually come from in the course is uh, engineering, uh, MBA, business school, uh, computer science, um, uh, social science and political science. And then sometimes we have other interesting, um, majors that we wouldn't have expected. We've had nursing students in the course, um, and other things and, and medical school students. And it's actually really interesting because we've had problems in the course where, you know, it's about increasing survivability on the battlefield. If someone gets wounded, you know, having that perspective is, is critical. And so that's the magic in the course is getting out of the classroom, but it's also this interdiscipl interdisciplinary perspective that's brought around the problem. And okay. one of the things I should just briefly mention uh, that we're trying to do. So if your audience or anybody out there um, can help with, uh, with this, what we're trying to do is expand. Um, we want more diversity and perspective, of course, in these courses. So right now we are, we do have a process for systematically recruiting underrepresented populations into the course. But we also want to expand to historically black colleges and universities, other minority serving institutions in the United States, community colleges, technical universities. So, um, you know, anybody who has good contacts in, the, in any of those locations, we're interested in trying to reach out to those entities. Yeah, well, you know, we can we can offer this platform here. The broadcast is another way to sort of reach out to those wider audiences and um, see who else we can get to participate. So, um, sort of in line with that, um, a follow on from Albert is what's the reception been to hacking for defense, you know, in, in those different countries, you know, partners, allies across the, you know, there's the United States Defense Department. And then we've got Chris here as well, you know, looking at the five eyes. And like I said uh, earlier on, there's all kinds of different alliance networks and partnerships um, mm -hmm. are uh, generally positive. And are you looking to, to grow into any other nations you haven't partnered with or, or parts of the world that you haven't necessarily partnered with yet? I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to just jump in and just give you my perspective. I helped um, with my colleague, Ali Hawks, to initially stand up the UK Hacking for Defense Program and Common Mission Project there. And I'll tell you, um, what's different is less about the, pers uh, per se, the perspective about defense, although there, are, there might be some differences. It's more about um, the universities. They in the universities in the UK are are less inclined, at least initially, to do more applied and experiential education, and and they ha and they go through a very rigorous process for approving every course. The US does too, but it's even more rigorous for a qualified course there. So I would say some of the hurdles reside in the university context, um, but I should note, like you know, civil society and us. 
in the UK certainly has a totally different relationship um, with the MOD in the UK. Um, and so um, folks in the UK want to work on problems that are more humanitarian focused and such. Um, notwithstanding our civil mill gap, it's it's actually there seems to be a little bit more of an openness than I than I experienced in the UK context. And then same in Australia to some extent, talking to our colleague Jamie Watson, but I'll let uh, Chris, you know, talk that in New Zealand. Yeah, the uh, I guess initially going back to 2016 when when I finished up studying at Sanford and came back home, it was um, uh, it was a harsh realization that uh, not everybody was willing to make the big leap uh, early on. Um, and I'm reminded of that old old slogan from way back in the day when I was a kid: is that nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Um, you know, there's a tendency within uh, defense and government to sort of um, buy from the longstanding contractors or, or the, the long established entities. And I think with uh, a now seven year track record uh, and exceptional growth um, and also a rapidly changing environment that people have become more aware of, uh, it's not just the early adopters. Uh, I think it's the the, the, the majority of folks in the bell curve are seeing that we need to make some changes. So I think the receptiveness is accelerating along with uh, the growth of the program, which is really good to see. Yeah, and on that point, just one other thought comes to mind on this topic is, um, you know, there's AUKUS, as you, you were alluding to, Ian, there's Five Eyes, there's all kinds of alliance. And, and they are trying to find, there is an interest in finding ways to work together on joint problems. And we have done, for example, pilots of UK Royal Navy and US Navy problems. We did that at a Georgetown course and we're doing one this semester at University of Pittsburgh. So um, increasingly, we're also trying to find ways that we can work together in this in this program. Great, thank you both. Um, so we're coming up on about an hour here and I do, there's uh, a couple more things I wanna get out here before we wrap up. Um, and uh, first point I wanna do this, um, I'm gonna get back into sort of like very Marine Corps specific stuff now because um, you know, I, I do owe that to our, the bulk of our students and folks here, our Marine Corps, but this goes to, um, Chris introduced, uh, on, on that email thread where we started this whole thing, we had, uh, uh, William, I'm blanking on his last name. Um, Trisiter. Trisiter, yeah. So it, you know, mentioned an email thread. Oh, by the way, he's with the Marine Innovation Unit. And as it happens, I got a chance to meet him last week because the whole Marine Innovation Unit, all like 200 something of them, um, there are a lot, a lot of people there, a lot more than I thought there would be. They were here for some sort of initial, you know, training and, um, you know, just kind of seeing who everybody else is and, and building the teams. But what is or what, if anything, has the relationship been with the Marine Innov Innovation Unit um, thus far um, in terms of the hacking for defense methodology? And I fully acknowledge, like, if it's not much, got it, because the MIU is a, is a pretty new entity in and of itself. Well, I, I would just jump in on that. Um, let me just first start broad. Um, our relationship in terms of problems from the United States Marine Corps is quite robust. Um, so we do get a number of problems from the Department of Navy, the Marine Corps specifically. Um, in relation to the Marine Innovation Unit, um, not yet, uh, I think, fully engaged, but I think they have an intent. And the way that they could support is certainly through problems and sponsoring problems into the course, but also through providing mentors. So each student team has a set of mentors, government and industry mentors often, and that helps them with their discovery process. So I think that's the direction that certainly William and his leadership, I'm sure is gonna help, you know, introduce the organization to the opportunity of Hacking for Defense. From my perspective, just viewing it as a, uh, uh, within the coalition, uh, uh, from an infantry rifleman's perspective, you know, there's a lot of changes happening. You've got with Force Design 2030 setting this cardinal direction. We've already seen some big changes. You know, uh, uh, U.S. Marine Corps has dropped armor, you know, and that that's caused a lot of big shock waves in the uh, uh, folks uh, with commentary. We've seen uh, more at my level, infantry level, I've seen a tectonic change in Marine Corps uh, uh, rifle squad. You know, it's it's it hasn't dropped the gun, but it's added the systems centric approach, which I think is really cool. Um, but it's not just that cardinal direction. There's going to be a whole lot of discovery and scaling that needs to be needs to go on between now and then to make it happen. And it's really cool to see William and uh, uh, the Marine In Innovation Unit, you know, is, is building out that infrastructure to, to execute on that. So, um, yeah, now it's it's pretty cool to bear witness to it. 
Yeah, I, I fully agree. I it was weird for me last week because you know you'd introduced me to William via email and was able to to snag him while he was here. But there were like I kept running into people from way back in my my Marine Corps career, sometimes like a decade or so ago, and they're now part of the Marine Innovation Unit. So I'm looking at the roster that they're building together, and there's definitely a lot of brain power, a lot of uh, very diverse skill sets that they're bringing in there. And you know it, it's very new, and I'm you know it's. And I think right now it's got it's going from the aspirational to the practical, how they can go across the fleet and help solve problems. But, uh, yeah, they're definitely putting a lot of talent together. So it'll be very exciting to watch them develop um, in the years to come as they start getting after specific problem sets from around the fleet. Um, OK, I'm, I'm going to throw one more question to both of you and then um, look at wrapping this up here. So um, from your respective sort of, you know, fighting positions there, how can whether it's U.S. service members or allied service members or or other members of our wider audience here for the broadcast, um, how can they get involved with ha the Hacking for Defense program, learn more about it, or potentially even take a course in it? Yeah, I mean, so three thoughts. One is in terms of getting involved in Hacking for Defense, and especially if you're a government, uniform, military, or civilian, is submit a problem and sponsor it in the course. And as I mentioned, we run generally about 20 to 30 universities here in the United States per semester. So it's a great opportunity to um, get your problems worked on with these universities. And then second is if you're not US and you're you know overseas, I mean, we want to, as, as Chris was noting, we want to um, get this program to not just the five eyes, not just NATO, but think about major so-called, you know, major non-NATO allies. Think about like India and other countries, um, allies that we have, you know, treaty-bound alliances with, like uh, the Republic of Korea. I mean, these are places that I think would be in Japan. These would be very strategic places to have this type of innovation capability. Thanks, Chris. Anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add is just reinforce. It's just uh, trying to build that, you know, common framework, common language, common culture. Uh, which builds those network connections and, and makes us better um, to win the future. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you both for that. So any any final thoughts or comments you'd like to share with our audience here before we wrap up? Yeah, probably the only thing I'll say is, um, Ian, would it be all right if uh, Alex and I throw you a couple links uh, for things that might be able to go in show notes, for example, for people to have a look there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and I would just, you know, um, say thank you to your audience and thank you to you, Ian, for hosting this. I mean, I think when well, often people ask me like, hey, Alex, what problems do you want to work on? And my my joke is a little bit, I want to work on all the problems. <laughs> you know, we want to solve all the problems. I'm agnostic on what problems we want to solve. We just have a core belief around how to work on those problems uh, through our method. And, you know, anybody who would like to, you know, get involved in it, there's plenty of opportunity, as I said, we're bringing together government universities and the private sector together around these critical national security and public problems. There's no shortage of ability to get involved. And so I'll throw my email also in the chat here. Um, and I know Chris will as well. And we'll, and we, and, and we'll uh, please reach out to us. And yeah, uh, and we'll certainly provide some follow up information for folks. The most one stop shop for hacking for defense is a website called h4d.us, which I'll put also in the chat and then also commonmission.us has all that information. And again, thank you. Great. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, all, all those links and contact um, points of contact. We'll throw in the show notes so people can reach out directly and see about either um, getting involved or pitching a problem that needs to be solved. Um, all right. Well, to Alex and Chris, again, thank you very much for uh, for joining us here today. And I, I do want to just take a second and give an extra shout out to Chris as one of, again, the plank holding founding members of the, the Krelex Center non-resident fellow program for those in our live audience right now. And then those who are going to be listening afterwards. We are, we're, uh, we have a new period of applications for a new roster of non-resident fellows. Um, details are, we've been posting on social media, but I'll, I might throw that in the, the links to the show note here just while we're talking about it. But I just think it's worth highlighting this, this sort of, connection and discussion here as one of the great outputs we've had from the non-resident fellow program, because it's, we've been able to speak to and gain access to people all in organizations all across like sort of the, the innovation spectrum, sometimes defense affiliated, but other times not defense affiliated, but those perspectives are very valuable as well. And it's just the, it, it, it reiterates the, the non-resident fellow program has exceeded beyond our wildest dreams in terms of the 
additional capability that it's given the Kulak Center, being able to feed into the students here, um, and then just building out a wider, you know, outreach community of interest to just, you know, share and discuss our, our respective problems and find um, groups of people to go help solve them. So, yeah, it's uh, great, Chris, that we were able to get you back here again for another one um, as we look at uh, sort of the next chapter of what the non-resident fellows are going to look like. Um, and as always, thank you for dialing in from New Zealand. Uh, it's I, I think it kind of helps that you were day in the day in the future um, for the timing wise. Um, yeah, but Chris, uh, Chris, and Alex, thank you very much again for our audience. Uh, thanks for joining us for this week's episode. We're going to have a couple more special episodes this week. One with Dr. Amin Tarzi, our director of Middle East Studies. Here, we're going to take a just a brief look at the new arrangement um, or renewal of diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran that just emerged over the weekend and brokered by um, by China, of all folks here. Interesting dynamic going on there. So he's going to kind of take us through it. And then we're also looking to have another down the rabbit hole on the Russia-Ukraine war with Dr. Yuval Weber some point this week as well. And our focus is going to be on Bakhmut. Um, from a variety of different perspectives here, but we hope that you can uh, you listen to all those. Just make sure you're following us on our you know various social media channels as we post those out. And again, uh, and one last note, we will be not doing any episodes next week as I will be enrolled in a course uh, for the whole week, but we'll be back before the, uh, the end of the month with a new set of episodes and we've got some great guests lined up. So again, thank you all. And uh, thanks for the time. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crewland community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.